Hey guys, what is going on? Welcome to the Tactical Jam Session. My name is Todd Fossey. I am the founder and chief instructor at Integrative Defense Strategies. And tonight, our topic is personal security operations. I'm thinking what I'm going to do. You guys let me know in the comments kind of what you think. But I'm thinking what I'm going to do here is... I'm going to turn this into maybe depending on what you guys want to do. I'm thinking I want to turn this into a series. All right, there's so much information to cover here. I was just going through one of my PowerPoint presentations that I had built today on this topic, and there were 97 slides. Um, so there's a lot of really, really important information in this topic that I want to be able to cover with you guys. And if you guys want to, let me know, and we can turn this into personal security operations, close protection, part one, two, three, and four. Maybe we do, if you guys want to, we can do, uh, you know, four, four, three to five of these. Okay. Um, I thought it would be good to go over this topic tonight because, well, it's right on the front of my mind. The, the, the tension is really high here. I'm just outside of Minneapolis and um, the George Floyd trial is going on here right now. And, you know, Things are getting intense, right? And uh, chances are pretty good that regardless of whatever happens with this trial, um, that things are going to go south in terms of, um, uh, you know, um, lots of lots of uh, protesting going on, um, lots of rioting, lots of protesting, um, social spontaneous social unrest. That's the term I was looking for. So being able to have security operations for yourself, for your family, and those that um, All right, am I back? Thanks for hanging with me, guys. I guess my computer decided it just wanted to turn off on its own. Ever had that happen? So are you guys still here with me? Sorry about that. Leave a comment to let me know if you guys are still with me. It looks like we still have some people on. Um, uh, what I was saying was with everything happening here in Minneapolis, it, it very quickly reminded me of how important um, it's going to be for us to have uh, security operations in place for ourselves and those that we love. So um, I, I thought we'd get into that um, tonight. Uh, I want to remind you guys that what we're going to cover is not a seminar. This is just going to be a, an overview for everyone's benefit. I'm concerned 
I'm concerned about everyone's security right now with everything that's happening in the world. Let me repeat that. I'm concerned. So I want to share things with you so that you can keep yourselves and you can keep your families as safe as possible. All right. That's, that's what tonight is is really all about and if you guys want additional see if we have a uh, yes yeah yeah thanks josh um if you guys uh, want additional episodes after this on this topic let me know there's an awful lot that we can cover um so if you guys have if you guys are serious about this for yourself if you guys have a pen and paper ready i recommend that you keep it close okay um so that you can take detailed you can take detailed notes on this for your uh for your benefit um before we get into this though i want to promote the guardian conference I will be teaching at uh, concealedcarry.com's Guardian Conference September 17th through the 19th. I will be teaching the weapons-based combatives portion. Guys, this is a really amazing lineup. If you guys can make it, it's in Oklahoma City at the Oklahoma City Gun Club. Um, other instructors uh, besides myself will be Larry Vickers, Spencer Keepers, Riley Bowman, uh, Matt Little, Brian Eastridge, Steve Moses, Chuck Haggart, Samuel Middlebrook, uh, Brian McCaughlin, uh, Henny Mahmoud, Andrew Bronca, and myself. I will be, again, I will be teaching the weapons based combatives portion. I um, believe that's happening over two and a half days, two and a half days of training. So, uh, or two days of training. You guys will definitely want to be there if you can. All right. Um, before we get. Josh Barry says, a brief series sounds like a great idea. I'm assuming that starting with individual and expand to group family. Eh, we're going to start with group and family because uh, that's what most people are going to be dealing with. Um, can't wait for GN conference. It will be an awesome weekend. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate that. Um, the way that we approach things, Josh, I know you have a lot of experience when it comes to executive protection and security. Um, this isn't going this th there might be some stuff in here for you that you might like but this is really going to be geared for the average person but primarily geared toward family operations full disclosure um, i am a certified executive protection agent through uh, progressive force concepts psoc program um, i do have operational experience but i have a lot of friends associates and colleagues who do that for a living full time um, I have been operational in the past, and occasionally I'll get a call to do a job, um, and I'll go hop on a job. But there are people out there who have a lot more experience than I do when it comes to executive protection. However, I just want to say this. However, that being said, that offers me an opportunity to not be overly immersed in the topic. What I mean by that, it's easy to only view things through the lens of a hardened professional. Um, what I've noticed throughout the years is that when it comes to just about anything, if someone is a full-time law enforcement or they've been in law enforcement for a while, they have a lot of experience with law enforcement, they see everything through the lens of law enforcement. When someone has been military for a long time or they have a lot of background with military, um, they have a tendency to see everything through the lens of military indoctrination. Someone's been executive protection, same. They see everything through the lens of executive protection. And so I do the best that I can to stay as objective as possible so that I can develop protocols that are gonna be most applicable to citizen defenders. I've been through lots of training and have trained lots of law enforcement, I've been, been through lots of training and trained military, through lots of training, trained myself and trained executive protection and security details and all this kind of stuff. And as I'm going through it, it very quickly I realize how little of that training really applies to average people and citizen defenders. So I do the best that I can to, to take all that information Right, take that experience and tailor it to what I think most people are going to be dealing with um, on, and in reality uh, um, when it comes to regular regular people and what their, what their context is. Because at IDS, context dictates strategy. Now, please don't be one of those people that says that I'm disparaging other disciplines. Of course I'm not. I'm just saying it's different. I'm not talking about better. I'm not talking about worse. I'm just saying it's different. To us, 
dic context dictate strategy. Um, before we get started here, I just want to talk about some of the books and some of the uh, resources and what some of my sources are here. Um, something that we'd like to do a lot here at IDS is give credit where credit is due. Um, so here's a few books for you guys who are interested in reading up on this stuff as well. Uh, the Fine Art of Executive Protection by Hunsaker. Exec Protection Specialist Handbook by Glazebrook. Just Two Seconds by DeBecker. Advanced Skills in Exec Protection by Hunsaker. A Sentinel by McNamara, Progressive Force Concepts, PSOC, Training Manual, Home Defense Rifle, Volume 1 from Sealed Mindset. Um, so I just want to get that stuff out of the way. Um, let's get into it. Um, Ta I mentioned DeBecker in a book by DeBecker, just two seconds. Great book, by the way. Um, I want to just sort of, sort of start with some more broad stroke concepts and then maybe get into things that are going to be a little bit more detailed, but we aren't going to get overly granular. However, All right, so at my back, my laptop keeps wanting to drop out, so I've switched over to my phone. <laughs> um, and sorry, let's go back to the comments. All right, so I switched over to my phone. Please let me know if you guys are still here. I really apologize for the technical problems, um, but we're just gonna stay with the phone right now. I know that um, the production quality might not be quite as good, but it is what it is. What's important is the information. All right. If you guys know, um, I'm not really here to entertain people. I'm here to save people's lives. Right. So if you're the kind of person that needs it to be entertained, then what we're doing here and what we're doing at IDS probably just is not for you. All right. So back at it. Um, getting back into Gavin DeBecker. Great book. Just two seconds. Um, Gavin Becker and, Dis and Associates have developed a really uh, what I think is a really solid acronym called LADDER. L-A-D-D-E-R. And that acronym stands for logistics, advance, distance, deterrence, evacuation, and response, ladder. We'll go through that one more time. Logistics, advance, distance, deterrence, evacuation, and response. Let's talk about logistics for a second. Being streamlined and well-organized allows for you to stay fluid and keep moving. It also allows you to keep your head in the game. This makes you and those that you're protecting a less attractive target. It's all about being organized. That's the logistics part of it. There's a reason why it's called a security detail, right? Because we need to be organized. It's all about the details. 
And I would say, while we don't have the time, we don't have as much time to spend on as many details when it, when it comes to yourself and it, when it comes to your family, paying attention to those details is probably more important. Not that we're not putting everything that we can into a principal when we're protecting somebody on executive protection detail, but it's going to be even more important because their, their, the value of their life is probably more important to you than anybody else. And your life, right? The, the, your life, their, their life depends on your life, right? So make sure that you're diving into the details and make sure you're well planned and that you're well organized. Then is the advanced work. Possessing in-depth advanced knowledge of the schedule, routes, venues, assets, and threats allow the defender, which is you, to control the environment and mitigate and avoid threats as much as possible. So advanced work. Um, we won't be going super in-depth into advanced work uh, tonight. We will be talking about advanced work, but we won't be going super in-depth into advanced work. Oh, I dropped out, right? I was going to talk about what the main topics are for them tonight. So bear with me while I look, look at those for you. Okay. Primary topics tonight, mindset, positioning, advanced work, venue, and site security. Those are the primary topics that we'll be covering tonight. So getting back to ladder here, right? We talked about logistics. So then we talked about the advanced work. So here's, here's an example, right? Here's an example of advanced work. Um, with everything that's been happening in Minneapolis lately um, for myself, uh, my wife works in, my wife works in sales. She does, my wife, my wife works in, in medical device sales. So I'll do some advanced work. And if uh, I'll, when things are bad, I go with her on her calls and I'll work from my car on my laptop or my cell phone. That's just what I do. Advanced work that I'll do. Um, I'll figure out what the routes are. I'll have primary, secondary and tertiary routes. I'll be on different apps looking at, are there, is there any social unrest in that area? What are the crime rates in that area? What's happening with traffic and weather conditions? You know, route planning is a big part of advanced work. We'll be talking a little bit about route planning. We'll probably have an entire, if you guys want to, we can have an entire episode just on route planning, which is a big deal. But I wonder where the safe where the safe houses are. Where are the police departments close by? Where are the fire departments close by? Where are the hospitals close by? She's go, She works in hospitals. So I know where those are at, but I want to know, does that hospital have an emergency room attached to it? Um, the list goes on and on and on when we're talking about doing advanced work, especially when it comes to route planning. But those are the kinds of things that I'll do with her. I'll figure out what's the fastest route, you know, what's the safest route, um, how long will it approximately take, what is the schedule, what time do I pick, her? what time do I drop her off, where do I pick her up, all of those different things. I'm on a very strict schedule, okay? Now, I'm not over the top about it. I'm not a douchebag. You know, the way also just things, other things like the way that I dress, I dress super casual and I'll blend in. I don't want to look tactical. I don't want to look like a cop. I don't want to look like an executive protection agent. I want to be gray man. I want to be low vis as possible. I don't want to stick out. Um, I don't want to stick out too much. But those are the, some of the things when we're talking about advanced work. We'll get into more of that as we continue through um, our conversation tonight. Distance. We want to create as much distance as po as reasonably possible between you and potential threats. You know, typically we'll maybe we'll get into more of this later. I want my threats to be as far away from me as I possibly can, ideally 25 feet or farther away, or I want to be as close to the threat as I possibly can so that I can go hands on as quickly as possible. All right. So when I'm thinking about where things are happening, Right. When we have really good situational awareness and we're, we're good at moving through common spaces and transitional spaces, we get good at figuring out what our distance management is going to be. Super, super important. Um, Tammy Jones says, indeed, may seem common sense, but we want to be sure that we're not missing anything. Yes, absolutely right. It's all about the details. Guys, we're probably going to be facing some pretty major social unrest coming forward. So we want to be as prepared for this as we possibly can. All right. All right. Here we go. Um, moving on. So distance management, then deterrence is the next in the ladder, right? Deterrence. Project a level of calm and confident awareness and readiness at all times, right? So how you move through a space, right? The, 
the more the, the more the more kind of calm assertive assertiveness that you have as you move through a space, what I call a neutral disposition. The more neutral disposition that you have, the more that you can sort of walk with a sense of purpose, walking a little bit faster than other people are. You know, I'm having your shoulders back and your heads up. The number one thing that violent criminals will look for is how a person carries themselves. I'm not going to be puffed up either. That will also attract aggression. I'm not going to be, you know, head on a swivel, right? Unless the threat level is extremely high. And then that will be a completely different conversation. But in most common threat levels, just moving confident, moving crisp, you know, um, just, just showing that I'm being observant, right? And then we'll talk a little bit later in terms of if I'm with my wife or there are other people in my group where I'm positioning myself in terms of my walking position. It's going to be a little bit different than when you're on a team. And I'll give you what my preferences are, my relative preferences are. There are no, I'm not going to talk about, there's no absolute truths here. I have my relative preference, and I will be talking about what those are. Okay, so the next on the, on the acronym is evacuation. Always have an exit plan. The more avenues of escape and egress that you have, the better. Always thinking about that. What are my escape routes? Always, always keeping that in mind. What's my primary escape route? What's my secondary escape route? Whenever I go to a location, I want to know where those, where those exits are, where those avenues approach. When we get into venue stuff, we'll, we'll be talking a little bit more about that. But at all times, I'm always five steps ahead. I always want to know where my evac and where my, and where my evacuation plan is going to be. And I have those in-depth conversations with my wife. And I prefer, depending on the principal, if I'm the executive in charge or whatever, AIC, then I like to have those conversations with my principal if my principal is comfortable with that. Many principals will not be comfortable with that. Um, and then last in the latter is the response, right? Sustained alertness and maximize tactical advantage at all times. How I'm positioning myself and always having tactical advantage, both offensively and defensively, to me, is the name of the game. Now, let's face it. When we're out and about, who do we have with us? We have loved ones. We have children. We have elderly. We have grandparents. We have parents. That, we have people who to have, no, have no situational awareness whatsoever and have no inclination for personal protection and self-defense whatsoever. It's just not a part of their makeup. It's not what they are. That's, our, that's what our job is, right? So those people can very quickly become a liability, but it's our job to make sure that we're having trained and measured responses when it comes to our, our planning and our responses in personal protection, right? Sound protection tactics oftentimes cause the attacker to hesitate, delay, or even abort their plan. So even though they've already have in mind that they're going to use violence, just by how you're positioning yourself and what your situational awareness is, as you're applying this acronym of LADDER, makes you a less attractive target. So they may have a plan saying, okay, I'm th I'm th th that's my target, but just how you're applying these principles makes you such an, uh, an unattractive target that they choose, to, they choose somebody else. That's the whole idea. Deter, 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 right? Attackers are hindered by time. And defenders, by t defenders that are at the ready and in position to prevail in a large percentage of the time. So how you're positioning yourself. Be fluid how you're positioning yourself. Be careful not to be overly fixated or static. Just because I like a couple of different positions, my experience will tell me moving through a common space or a transitional space. You know, let's just say I'm, I, mean, I always think about protecting my wife. So for now, let's talk about her. As I'm moving through that space, I will position myself in relationship to her based on what's most tactically advantageous for us, okay? Um, be present and eliminate distractions. Don't let loved ones dissuade you from doing your job. They don't understand, right? This is a big thing. They'll be like, oh, you don't have to do that. We all have that happen. Oh, you're just overreacting. That's not important. Don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. You have this in your DNA to watch over your loved ones and watch over the flock. Why do I know that? Otherwise, you wouldn't be watching this right now. You wouldn't be watching this right now. Okay? It's in your DNA. It's what you are. You are a protector. You are a citizen defender. Don't listen to them. You're the one with the training. You're the one with the experience. You're the one with the instincts when it comes to this. So don't let your loved ones dissuade you. You do what you need to do. The last thing that you want to happen is to be faced with a critical incident, right? Last thing you want to ha be happen is to be faced with a critical incident and not being able to defend them because they tried to 
dissuade you from doing it because it didn't make them comfortable. You don't have to make them uncomfortable, but you have to be able to assert yourself at the same time. Be careful with secondary tasks and multitasking. We don't multitask. Human beings don't multitask, all right? That's not a thing. We can stack, but multitasking, um, that's, going, that's going to erode your focus, and it's going gonna, it's gonna, to it's gonna hinder you a lot. It's going to knock you out of your situational awareness. So stay present. Develop, a, develop, develop the mental skill of staying on task, of being alert and aware, right? Experience each variable as new. The more your mind drifts, the more vulnerable you and your loved ones become. And also be care, be careful of cravings. That can be a great distraction too. So don't go into a situation where you're the executive detail for your family. If you're hungry, if you're thirsty, if you're overly tired, you know, um, if you're having cravings for a cigarette or something else like that. Those different types of physiological cravings and other types of trick cravings can be a can be a major distraction. So stay on task, stay relaxed, right? Don't be overly intense, right? Soften your vibe. There's lots of reasons why I recommend you want to soften your vibe, but um, be careful that you're not distracting yourself, right? Focus, focus, focus. It's all about focus. It's all about reactionary gaps. It's all about time and distance management. It's all about OODA loop. Right? We don't want to slow down that OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, act. We don't want to slow that down, and distractions will slow down your OODA loop. All right? So next, talking about mindset a little bit. You are the apex predator of the attacker. That's how I think of it. I'm not just the predator. I am the apex predator of the attacker. I am the attacker of the attacker. I am the attacker of the attacker. I am an attacker's worst nightmare. That doesn't mean I'm not working within the use of force continuum. That doesn't mean I'm not practicing a, a measured response. I am practicing a measured response, right? It doesn't mean that I'm not working with, within the legalities. Of course, I'm working within the legalities. But when it comes time to take action, you are the predator of the predator. You are the apex predator. So by mentally framing yourself as the apex predator of the attacker, you psychologically and biologically, your psychology and your biology aligns itself consistently with that purpose, right? So embody the role of the, as the apex predator at all times while playing the security role for yourself and for your family. Now let's talk about positioning a little bit. How you adapt yourself and those that you're protecting within a fluid environment is critical. The closer you can be to an attacker or the farther away you can be, like I mentioned, 25 feet or out, the better off you're going to be. This either places you ahead of the reactionary gap or far enough away to greatly diminish the risk. This is the whole idea. And if you guys are curious about what my personal preference is in terms of a walking position, if I'm with people that I love and I'm by myself, if I'm walking with Marissa most of the time, if I'm in any kind of a high risk or in any type of a risk environment at all, I won't stand next to her and hold her hand. Now, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but I need to, I need angles. So I prefer if we talk about 12 o'clock, if she's here, 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock, then I prefer to be at 4 o'clock or 8 o'clock. 4 o'clock or 8 o'clock gives me a really good overwatch over the situation. I have a better, better field of view as I'm back here at 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock. And we've also found through a lot of a lot of testing that we've done here that we have better angles to intercept as well. We have better lines of fire as well. So in terms of my positioning, if I'm walking through the transitional space or common or common structure, I prefer to be at four o'clock or eight o'clock. I've found for me that gives me the most tactical advantage. Paulo says, nice bit of advice. Don't be ashamed into tactically disadvantaged condition. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Paula. I really appreciate that. Um, so on a side note here, we're not going to be covering profiling tonight. We're not going to be covering pre-incident indicators or pre-attack indicators. But if you guys want to in future episodes, I have a lot on this and I have a lot of insight when it comes to pre-incident and pre-attack indicators. So please let me know in the comments below if you'd like me to do an episode on that, because that by itself um, is its own episode. And in my opinion, it's super, super important. But maybe it's not interesting to you guys. 
if it is interesting to you, if you'd like me to cover profiling, let me know and I'll do an entire show just on profiling. So leave that a comment. Leave a comment if that's what you guys want. Okay, let's talk a little bit about advanced work or security advances. Um, usually when you're on a security detail, that's a big job. You're going, to, you're going ahead of the principal, you're going ahead of the EAC, and you're working out all the routes and you're, you're surveying all of the venues. Okay. Uh, John says, yes, profiling. Paulo says, nuances of pre-attack indicators beyond the stuff martial arts cover. Absolutely. Aaron says, hubby just admitted he walks four and eight, two. Never realized that. Yeah, that's right. So We'll, we'll do an episode on profiling for sure, way beyond what martial arts teach. That's a, it's super important. It'll be a whole, it'll be at least an hour just to talk about that. Um, but we don't have time for that tonight. Spencer says, very interested in profiling, pre-attack indicators, and pre-incident for sure. Okay, so maybe next episode we'll uh, we'll cover that. Um, but but listen, let's let's be realistic in terms of what our time restrictions are and what our what budgets are and how many people we have. Typically, you're going to be doing your own advance work. And how much advance work I do depends on the situations. Sometimes, like if Marissa's going to a hospital where I'm like, oh shit, like I gotta I gotta block an hour out of my day to do advance work. Cause I'm gonna go with her and there's no fucking way I'm not gonna do advance work for her. And I'm going with her on this call. Other times I'm doing advanced work on the fly. She knows how I do this and how it works. If you were with us in the group and you didn't know that's what I was doing, I wouldn't let, probably wouldn't let you know. And I would be doing advanced work without you even knowing that I was doing it because people just get freaked out by it. Some people I'll tell them, you know. So some of my best friends are you work full time on EP details. So they know, they know what I'm doing. And typically they'll jump in and they'll do things with me because they, they like that as well. But they do it so often, it's mentally exhausting for them to do it. So usually I'll just take it over just so they can have a mental break and they can have a nice time. You know, I'll, I'll, hand, I'll handle that situation. I'm probably, I just do it out of habit anyway. So I'll probably just do that. Okay. So some of the things you may be able to conduct as a citizen defender, right? Um, you can check apps and scanners. Here's some, here's some suggestions for you for apps and scanners. Um, there's different apps out there that you can find out what's happening with construction in your area. That's important. So, you know, you got to know where the choke points are at. All right. You got to know where the danger zones are at when you're for your, just a really quick route survey. Knowing what's the, what the traffic conditions are. Are there protests or riots that are happening in that area? Very real here in Minneapolis. We have spontaneous social unrest just like that. We, it just happens out of nowhere. So we want to make sure that we're avoiding those areas as much as possible. And then, you know, other things too, parades, things like that. Um, those are a few things. Uh, some more things that you can do with just really quick advanced work. Just planning and logistics, getting your EDC, what are your, you're getting your equipment together, all that kind of stuff. Venue and location, what's the address? planning and surveying primary and alternative driving routes, talked about that earlier. Travel time and distance, talked about that earlier. Things that you can plan. Create an itinerary, I talked about that. I'm very scheduled when I do this with her. She knows that, right? Arrival times, departure times, you know, address routes, phone numbers, nearest, nearest police uh, fire department, emergency rooms, some other advanced route work, parking and vehicle staging. Where are you going to park? What's the parking situation there, you know? Um, nor the floor plan and the layout. I always know the floor plan and the layout as much as I possibly can. Okay. I'll, I'll, get, I'll look it up online what the floor plan is, or I'll go in there in advance for her and I'll know what the floor plan is and it will in advance, right? I'll make a threat as assessment of the routes and the venue. I'll know the location of where all the restrooms are at. I'll make contact with venue security. This is a big one. I will make contact with venue security. And I do this when I'm traveling on my own as well. I'll, I'll go up to the hotel concierge and I'll say, hey, can I talk with security? Just I'll let them know, let you guys know I work in executive protection. I just like to meet, introduce meet myself. Now I have an asset, right? They become my, they become a conduit for me. So I want to know who the, that is. When I take Mercy to a hospital, 
she doesn't know this, I don't think, but when I drop her off, I'll make contact with security. So if anything goes wrong, I have a relationship with them. They know my skill level. They know my knowledge to a degree. So that way, if we see each other and things go south, we already have a bit of a report in place that can be a really big asset for you. So do that as much as possible. When I'm at airports, I'll typically go up and I'll, and I'll introduce myself to law enforcement if I can. Right. Or if there's people that I know in TSA because I train people a lot, I'll just say hello to them just to let them know I'm in the building. So if things go south, I have that relationship already built up. So that's really important. Like I mentioned, I like to determine where the safe havens are, where the rally points are. So if we get separated, where is our rally point? Where's the safe haven? OK, here, babe, check this out. Here's uh, here's we're already at a hospital. That's a pretty safe place for us to be. But if we're in route. There's a fire department right here. There's a police department right here. But here. Here's where, you know, Shannon, our friend, there's where Leakey lives. So we know that we have safe houses at different different spots throughout our route. Um, I locate where the fire extinguishers are, right? Um, so there's just the, keeping it super simple, guys. When we're talking about, you know, we're talking about reality for everyday life for regular people. The advanced work has to be more simplified. A lot of times it's happening on the fly, but do as much of those things as you can in advance before you even leave. Have that stuff pre-planned out. All right, so venue and site security for regular people. Um, some of the things I like I like to cover, let's see. Yeah, citizen operation, op operating systems. Uh, he listens to the scanners daily. Yes, and broadcastify. That's really great. And then there's lots of other great apps out there um, that can help you with your planning. Um, so that's that's another great one that we do here at home as well. We'll just want to make sure what we know is happening out there in advance. Okay, so venue and site security for regular people. We like to recommend traveling in groups when possible. Before you leave your vehicle, right, pause. Take an in-depth look 360 degrees around you, right? Make this a habit. Don't just get out of your car. Just pause for a second and scan the environment and make a threat assessment, right? Make this a habit. Look for people who are looking at you. This is a really big clue. We're not getting into profiling too much and pre-incident pre indicators or pre-attack indicators tonight. But one thing that I can mention tonight, so it won't take up too much time, is just look for people who are looking at you or look for people who are doing what's called conspicuous ignoring, or people who aren't looking at you in an unnatural way. If it, does, if it looks like it's unnatural how they're looking away from you, that's another clue for you. You want to pay close attention to that, all right? Trust your instincts. We we'll covered this in the profiling as well, but trust your instincts back into parking spots that allows for good oversight and quick evacuation if you need to. Oh, if you Very rarely will you ever see me not backed into a parking spot. And usually I leave myself room or I'll put myself in a position that annoys the crap out of my wife, but I just like oversight on the area. I like to be, have good fields of view. I don't like blind spots and danger zones, things like that. So how you position yourself with parking is really, really important. All right. When in doubt, if things don't feel right, stay in your vehicle. It's a good barrier and it's good for protection and you can always drive away. Once you've exited your vehicle, right, plan a walking route with the least amount of risk. Another thing that I do as I'm scanning my environment and I know where I want to go because I know the majority of critical incidents for our regular people happen in transitional spaces during hours of darkness, all that kind of stuff. I want to plan, okay, what's the safest route for me, right? And that's also great conflict avoidance. That's what I want, conflict avoidance. So what's my safest route for me to walk there and walk back, right? If I have to, right, as I've talked about earlier, make sure that we're always using the appropriate level of force. And that includes if you have to use your vehicle as a weapon. Do you all know and understand when is it when it's legal to use your vehicle as a weapon? Right? When is it legal for you to use your vehicle as a weapon? Well, a weapon is a weapon is a weapon. And you should know that using your vehicle as a weapon, your vehicle is a lethal weapon. 
So in most jurisdictions, you have to be reasonably in immediate fear of death or great bodily harm. In some jurisdictions, you have to be reasonably in immediate fear of death or substantial bodily harm, means, which substantial bodily harm means protracted loss or impairment of any bodily member or organ. It means that your leg's going to be broken for a while or you're going to be hospitalized for a while, but you're probably not going to die. Know what the laws are governing use of force wherever you are at, right? As a gross generalization, when you are in your vehicle, if someone is trying to enter your vehicle, okay, they are showing lethal intent. If they have an impact weapon in, in, in immediate proximity to you and they're threatening to break that glass, right, you are reasonably in immediate fear of death or great bodily harm or substantial bodily harm. Obviously, if, if it's a if it's a it's a, if a firearm, it would be it would be the same thing. Or perhaps it's a mob of people who are trying to tip your vehicle over, or a mob of people are trying to enter your vehicle. You are reasonably in immediate fear of death or great bodily harm. In most of those cases, the, the disparity in force is great enough where you can justify. It, and you don't have to use you don't have to be overly offensive, but you need to get yourself out of that situation, right? So you'll get to whatever your location is. So I will rinse and repeat this process as I get back to my vehicle. And before I leave the building, I'll scan and I'll look around. I'll figure out what the safest route is. I'll just make a threat assessment when I'm going back to my vehicle as well. So these are some really important things, especially when you're with your family, because the family just wants to get out of the car. They don't really want to have situational awareness, you know. So you, you teach them. Teach them. Okay. Whoever's in person in charge of security here, teach them. Look, we're just going to pause for a second. Before we're, no one even has to know what we're doing. We can just make it look like we're waiting for somebody. We're just going to pause for a second. And we're going to follow these steps. and We're going to develop these steps as a habit. We're going to develop these steps as a habit. So when you're out with the family, other things that I recommend doing, take a picture of the parking zone. Make a mental note. Of a, of a reference point where a landmark to remember where you've parked. The last thing you want to do is look lost and disoriented. That makes you a very attractive target. And what else is it doing? It's splitting your focus. It's splitting your attention, it's splitting your situational awareness, right? So you can become more attractive. I always do that. I take a picture of wherever the parking zone is. So I can just look on my phone quick before I leave the building. I, okay, that's right. I remember where I'm at. I'm in B12, right? So I know where I'm going, right? Um, search and enter the elevators before your family. Marissa knows I do this. So if an elevator opens, I don't just go in. And she doesn't just go in. And I always go in first. I like to stand right here. I'll just poke my head in. I'll just scan that elevator. Well, no matter where I'm going, maybe it's a, I'm going up some staircase. I'll just scan that area before we walk in. I, just, I don't just walk into those situations blindly, especially if I'm with her. Okay. Um, other things. Um, look for secondary exits of the parking lot. Uh, will it be dark when you leave? That's another consideration. Scan the area for threats. We talked about that. Assets and liabilities. Where are the exits? Avenues of approach, barriers, cover of concealment. What are your first five moves? Where are the natural lines of drift? Super important. Natural lines of drift. Where are people going to flow? Maybe, maybe this is a situation where I'm like, ah, you know, Active shooter breaks out here. Where are people going to go? Where are people going to move? Active shooter is a whole nother topic. We'll have a whole conversation more in depth than what we have about this, about how to respond to that. But I want to get to the outside. More people are killed from being trampled to death, right? If they're in a large crowd than they are from the active shooter themselves. So knowing how to position yourself, knowing when and how to move, where are, right? Where are those lines of drift? Where's the cover? Where's the concealment? All of that stuff. Really, really important. The more that you, that's like driving, right? The more that you drive, the more unconscious competence you have with knowing where those natural flow lines are, those natural lines of drift, right? Dealing with bathrooms. We're dealing with, as a society right now, we're dealing with human trafficking. Human trafficking is an epidemic. So a lot of violent and, and a, a lot of human traffickers are loitering in and around bathrooms. So a lot of bad things that happen in and around public bathrooms. So some suggestions that I have. If Marissa goes to the bathroom, say we go to a movie or a public place and she needs to use the bathroom, I stand right outside the door. 
because what they'll do is they'll place women inside the bathroom and they'll drug other women inside the bathroom or young girls even, and children as well. They'll drug them inside the bathroom and they'll take them out. So I stand right outside the bathroom and I wait for her. That's just the way that it is. I don't like her to be like without me, like if, if that's the case. So I will, if I, I'll hold it. I don't have to go to the bathroom right now. I don't want her standing outside in that public place. So I will wait right outside of the women's bathroom to make sure that she's going to be okay. Um, Brian Rodriguez says, great info. Thanks, man. Appreciate the feedback. Um, you know, if she goes into the bathroom, I'll tell her, like, hey, just do a quick glance in that bathroom. Just see who's in there. Don't just go in there with your head down like, like, you, normally, like you normally would. Take two seconds and just scan the environment before you go into the women's bathroom, okay? Um, so that way you know if there's anybody else in there, okay? Uh, listen, I'm sure many of you fathers have done this. If you have young girls, that's not safe for them to go in the women's bathroom by themselves. So just take them in the men's bathroom. We've all seen it. You know, many fathers have done it. The men, listen, real men understand. They're like, right on. She can have my stall. No problem. They want your daughters and your and your, your daughters and your sons. They want your young children to be safe. They want that for them. That's not a problem. Don't be afraid to take your young children, your young daughters into the men's bathroom with you. That's not a problem at all. Okay. Then do a quick glance and walk through. I do it when I'm by myself. When I'm in a public bathroom, I'll do a quick glance, right? I want to check out where the blind spots are. I want to have a threat assessment of that bathroom before I go in there, even when I'm by myself. You know, carrying when you're using the bathroom, that's a whole nother conversation. That's a 20, 30 minute conversation we're not going to have tonight. To me, it's its own skill set. Um, surrogates and force multipliers, we've talked about that. Like I like to have surrogates in areas. I like to know who the security operators are in that area i want to know i want to have assets wherever i go so develop surrogates all right um they're awesome whatever full force multipliers i can have i'm gonna have them okay um other things right like planning how do i get in how do i want to get out multiple ways in and out exits which we've already talked about so Look, here's just a few things, right? Here's a, I don't want to overload anybody tonight, but hopefully there's some stuff in here that you can sink your teeth into and you can start to apply right now. If I give you everything right now, one, this is going to be a seven hour, this is going to be a seven hour show. We're not doing that. And, and two, it's going to be too overwhelming for you. So take these pieces and start to apply it to your life in reality. Start to make these things habit almost immediately. And then just continue to make these things a habit. And I promise you, this isn't, this might feel for some of you like it's kind of this overwhelming thing, like it's super cumbersome. I promise you, after a while, it's not. You just weave it into the fabric of your life and it just simply becomes a lifestyle. Um, Aaron says, I assume that bathrooms of interstates are targeted the most. They can be on the highway and gone in a flash. No doubt about it. Does everybody here know how many children go missing in the United States every year? I'll ask you guys this question. And don't cheat. Don't cheat. Do you guys know how many, how many children in the United States go missing every year? You'll be absolutely and utterly shocked. How this isn't the biggest deal in our culture, how, how we don't see this as the biggest epidemic in our culture. How many children go missing in the United States every, United States every year? 41,000? Way higher. 800,000. 800,000. Wherever you're sitting right now, probably within a just of a radius of just a few miles, there's probably human trafficking happening wherever you're at. The friends that I have that are police officers that work in human trafficking units, they, they, they just, they would say if people knew the reality, they'd be utterly shocked. Um, Lance Clammer says, uh, great information. Didn't realize how many, how many practices you're talking about. I've naturally done the vehicle as a weapon. Good information. Keep doing you, brother. Thanks a lot, Lance. I really appreciate that. And, and guys, just so you know, in terms of the human trafficking thing, right, in terms of the human trafficking thing, um, 
it isn't just young girls and young young boys too, but it's also it's, it's also women. It's also women of all ages. It's also women of all ages. Okay, so let's not have this normalcy bias and think that bad things only happen to other people in another place. They don't. They happen to us as well. We don't have to live through life in a way that's like paranoid and unpleasant. I have this saying, it's like, it doesn't make you paranoid to be prepared. It just means that you care. It just gives you added peace of mind. Having this, these skills and having this knowledge, just, you know, it just gives, it's just an insurance policy. It just gives you an added peace of mind. And either you have it in you to do these things or you don't. It's either in your DNA or it's not. Right. So, all right, guys. So here's just a few things for you. Um, I hope that you guys found this information helpful. It sounds like you guys would like to turn this into a, um, a series. So uh, we'll, we will, in fact, we will do that for sure. We'll turn this into a series for you guys. Um, uh, we'll also, just so you guys know, uh, we'll do this again with maybe two, three, four weeks. We'll see how things are going. Two, three, four more weeks, see how things are going. We do boot camps on this topic where we get into the kinetic skills of this as well. So we do the training and the education and the kinetic side of it as well. We do these citizen defender boot camps, what we call close protection and personal protection security operations. To We do those anywhere from four hours to three and a half days long. And it's a part of our instructor certification as well. Level four for the IDS APEX instructor certification is close protection and personal security operations as the primary theme. So we literally will spend three and a half days just on this topic at a very high level, very sophisticated level, actually. So, all right, guys, uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Check out next week. Please tune in as I post these. Please click that reminder button so that we can stay in touch. The more people that we can have out there using these skills and passing it on and sharing it with everybody else, the safer the world is going to be. Thanks a lot, guys. Mm -hmm.